Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. HRN is food and beverage radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. So you don't shun the devil with your rock and roll load. Knows that country music's gonna save your soul. The devil runs his groove in them rhythm and blues that sound. It's gonna get you Welcome back to the Speakeasy. I'm Damon Volte. I'm Souther Teague. And I'm Greg Benson. Well, All right. Greg, you have anything you want to say? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just, I just have, I have some prepared thoughts for this. Um, yeah, first of all, um, my head really hurts today because, because uh, yesterday I did something I haven't done in about probably four years, which is that I worked a 15-hour shift on my feet. Um but not at a bar. Uh, for the first time, I was actually uh, working with a campaign. It was a poll watcher for uh, the Democratic candidate down here in the weirdly swing district that I live in in Brooklyn. Did he win, Greg? Absolutely not. He got crushed. But um, <laughs> it was interesting because, one, again, I haven't stood on my feet for 15 hours straight. And this was in the cold, too, which was less than fun uh, since, I think, 2018 was the last time that I was actually behind a bar for that long. And uh I still got it, so that's fun. All right. But also it was kind of uh, – and, and I'm going to do something that I don't often do on this show, which is get a little sentimental, which is that um, it made me a little nostalgic for that sense of just kind of like being there for other people for that long because mm-hmm. – at face value, what I was doing was not fun. No reasonable human being would look at what I was doing and say, that's a great time, sign me up. But I was doing it because I thought it was a the right thing to do and that it would help other people. Civic duty, buddy. Yeah. And, and there is something, I think, in all of us, the good ones, that do you know the, the bartending thing and stand behind a bar for 15 hours straight that I, you know we enjoy – Being there for other people, we enjoy helping to improve their lives, whether that's for a night with some cocktails or for the next two years with politicians who uh, don't suck, which um, if they win, which again, my guy did not, it wasn't even close, but um, but it's nice to kind of be reminded that that is something that's at the core of uh, the service industry. You lose sight of that if you don't do it for a long time. It was a nice refresher. Yeah, I can, totally, I can totally see that. Well, yeah, yeah. I'm glad you're out there. And, you know, I think we all woke up today, uh, maybe a little too much hand wringing and pearl clutching over the past couple of days uh, and weeks leading up to this midterm. I think we all woke up today uh, and saw the results that are still trickling in, the last of them, aren't as bad as we thought. So I think, uh, I don't know, a new day is dawning. Yeah, it's it, it could definitely have been worse, which is nice to see. Um, I get that a lot. <laughs> There's definitely... Who is that mysterious disembodied voice in the studio with us today? Well, let's bring him on <laughs> in. Uh, that is a good friend to the show, good friend to me, good friend to us all. Chris Elford phoning in all the way from Seattle. Uh, what's happening, Chris? Welcome to the studio. Hey, buddy. Very, very Thanks nice to hear me. your voice. Yeah, no, always happy to talk to you. I think 
we often talk on the phone and when we do, well, we actually we don't often talk on the phone, but when we do, we always say that it's great to talk to each other uh, and we should do it more often. And then somehow we don't do it as often as we would like to. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm always happy to hear your voice and talk to you and, uh, you know, want to let the audience know who you are, which of course, uh, former Amori Amargo alum, you and I stood behind that tiny bar together for a long time. Then you moved out to Seattle where you opened up Navy Strength that got best new cocktail bar in America from Tales of the Cocktail in 2018. Then you opened up No, no Anchor, which uh, got best restaurant in the semifinalists for the James Beard, uh, sorry, best new restaurant semifinalist in 2017 from the James Beard Foundation um, and other things like that. You're a certified Cicerone. And now what you've done is uh, you've opened up a gigantic brewery called Here Today. It's only been open for a few weeks. Uh, I definitely want to talk about that. But man, you're, you're really out there storming the beaches. <laughs> I mean, I'm doing what I love, you know. Which is what? Comedy? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's only comedy if people are laughing. Otherwise, it's just a speech. Um, I am. I, I mean, I'm. I'm getting to um, create and and serve things that I really love. And um, you know, most of my energy goes into kind of like how we serve it, which has become more of my focus over the years than a little bit less on what's in the glass and a little bit more on kind of like how we're how we're delivering it to people and how we're reaching people. But um, yeah, I, I definitely, despite how how busy I am, I, I wake up every day pretty excited to to get to do what I do. Well, I need Consider you to expand. I need personally. you to expand a little bit on on what you just said. Like, given that you're now literally making the product that's in the glass, you're still focused more on how it, how it's served and the service around it than than what's in the glass. Well, I think that like when I when I say it's when when I say like what's around the glass, I'm not just talking about like how we serve it because I think you can get caught up in that too, and I, I think it's an important thing to think about, but I don't necessarily think it's like the most important thing. Um, when we got into, okay, I got into craft beer in like the early 2000s and I got into cocktails in like the late aughts. And back then there were only kind of like so many books. There were only so many mentorship opportunities. There were no podcasts about booze. There, you know, like 99% of the books that we all uh, have learned from weren't, weren't created then. Um, and so there was kind of this like mad dash to try and like discover all that we could, but I genuinely feel like so many books have been written at this point and so many things that used to be like this super secret technique that, it, that my buddy taught me or whatever is like, Oh yeah, I read about, I saw, I saw that on a Netflix show or, or whatever. <laughs> um, so, you know, I just feel TikTok. like, yeah, I saw it on TikTok. So I Damon, just like Damon has that, never um, been on TikTok, by the way. <laughs> you, that you know um, of. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's like, you know, that stuff has been spoken about so much, like almost ad nauseum, that I feel like we don't have to focus on it quite so much anymore. And people are starting to talk more about not just like, what are we serving to people in this room? But like, what is the room? Who's in the room? Like, who are we? Whose voices are we elevating? Um, you know, like how are we reaching our community better? And, um, all of us do this without like intentionally thinking about it or not one way or the other. And, uh, I don't know. I just find that it's very fulfilling to talk about <clears throat> and, and ideate on. How do you, uh, and cause I'm sure I'm certain I've known you long enough. So I know that you have, uh, considered all angles. How do you reckon this is impacting the business itself? Um. I, well, I guess at the end of the day, I don't necessarily make any of these decisions because of how they would impact the business, like one way or the other. You know, it's almost like that old saying, you can't cook scared. I think when you're talking about like community engagement, like sometimes those um, steps to like further yourself in, in community aren't necessarily going to make you money, um, but they will you know, reach the right people and they will kind of like enrich your lives. And so if you think about it from the, just the perspective of business, like very few of the decisions that we make would make sense. But if you think about it from the concept of like wealth and people and wealth and relationships and, and friendships and community, then it starts to make a lot more sense. Right. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're basically building customers for life and a community in that way. Right. I mean, that's, Get people coming back. Yeah. 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 I would just go back to that. Uh, you can't cook scared bit and say uh, you've never cooked live eel. Um, 
<laughs> that's fucking scary. Uh, well, I love, you know, you and I are great friends and I love you dearly and I love your approach to, to the way that you do service. Let's talk about that some in relation to your, your other projects, you know, Navy Strength and um, now what's called Trade Winds Tavern. Um, mm-hmm. what's going on at those spots? And then we'll definitely get into talking about here today because that's what I really want to talk to you about. Yeah. Um, Navy strength. So we opened Navy strength in uh, spring of 2017 and, um, it is a tropical cocktail bar, um, where each menu focuses on a different part of the world. And we take kind of like inspiration from the the people and flavors and service styles from, from that part of the world. And, and sort of like, it was sort of as a reaction to what we didn't like about about tiki culture, which is like this sort of like idealized and often appropriated vision of the world through the lens of white dudes. And instead of uh, kind of like saying like, hey, here's an idea of like a quote unquote exotic place, like here's an actual place in the world. These are actual people. Um, what do they have to, to tell us? Like we don't tell them like what they're doing like let's look at what they're doing and listen to what they're saying and and create something as a result of that so we've done menus inspired by india uh the philippines morocco oaxaca um uh god philippines japan and all of these um menus you know all the drinks like look like tropical drinks and taste like tropical drinks but they have these really sort of like unique stripes to them that are colored in by, you know, centuries of, of history and, and flavor. And it's fun for me because I mean, at this point I've worked with a hundred ingredients that I I never would have worked with before had I just kind of stayed in my safe space, if that makes sense. Yeah, Um, absolutely. How do you go about like sort of doing the the hard part of the, the researching for these sorts of menus? And then, and then frankly, the sourcing of these ingredients. Um, the sourcing is kind of hard. I mean, you kind of have to be willing to, um, to take what you can get sometimes on sourcing because like the, especially post pandemic, like the, um, the food way and like ingredient systems have, you know, only gotten trimmed even further. So you have to kind of be willing to, you know, use the, you know, time temperature pressure, uh, model to get like flavor out of some ingredients because they might be coming to you powdered and dry instead of fresh. Um, but yeah, I think just like, you know, we talk about R and D, but I feel like, and you mentioned the R research. Um, I feel like a lot of people kind of like jump right into the development side of it without like doing any reading and kind of like talking with people. And, uh, you know, so I normally start there, like on the computer, the same as, as probably any of you would. Um, and then as I'm tasting ingredients and starting to like, get inspired um i tend to i tend to think about like what would pair with this ingredient that is in my like flavor lexicon um and then what is something that i traditionally pair with that so we have ingredient a is the one that i've never really worked with before ingredient b is something that's in my common like uh flavor lexicon and then we have ingredient c which is something that i commonly pair with ingredient b then I knock out ingredient B and it's no longer a part of the equation. And I have a unique like flavor combination between A and C that might've been like a harder jump to get to, but it's like, sounds a little formulaic, but it works pretty well for making kind of like compelling, but off the beaten path flavor combos. Uh, I, I, I love that. And I love the, the, the research and the care that goes into that because so many of these, as, as you mentioned, I think part of the problem specifically with, you know, what, what, I'm trying not to call tiki culture anymore, um, comes from the sort of arrogance that comes from like, you get one, one little snippet, one little piece of information out of context about a different culture and certain people, um, I'm sure a lot of our listeners are probably screaming into their headphones or to their car stereos right now and going white dudes, um, will say, okay, well, I understand this now, you know, I, I, I've got a handle on this and 
I'm a master at this. And they sort of build out the strength that really is this kind of pastiche mismatch that is a disney example of like what we would think of as exotic, air quotes, air quotes. And mm-hmm. and you were mentioning when we were chatting before the show that that's something that, that even goes beyond tropical drinks, that that's something that has affected a lot of cocktails that we think of as classics. You know what? I was teaching a, I was teaching a class for... Um for Ford's gin uh, like online during the pandemic and kind of like the history of, of gin through cocktails. Um, and I'm teaching it there and I'm, t- you know, I'm talking about all of the like classics that, that would come to mind, like the, you know, the older classics um, that come to mind. We went through punch. We would talk about, you know, the Collins and French 75 and all these things. And, um, I don't know. The further I got down the rabbit hole, the more I was like, how much better would all of these classics that we, I mean, all of us in this room, I think agree that learning the classics is the best way to, um, to learn cocktails because it's kind of like learning all of these rules so that you can someday intelligently break them all. Um, Mm -hmm. but all of these classics that we're learning were created by a very small percentage of the population who held all of the power. And I just like, I think that the world of cocktails would be a lot better if other people had the microphone back then. And like now that we are in a place to give other people the microphone, and when I say give it, that's like recognizing the power um, that is being a like educated, able bodied, white, cisgendered dude. Um, we are inherently kind of like born into this power, and it is like important that we then take that microphone and give it to other people, which also involves shutting the fuck up sometimes. And mm-hmm. it involves, you know, championing and, and, and applaud, applauding other people and things as simple as sharing someone's Instagram story, um, you know, getting them involved more in the conversation. But yeah, I just think that like in general, the, the cocktail world would have been so much better if other people had had a hand in like creating not just our um, cocktails, but our spirits, like the raw ingredients themselves. I mean, I don't think you. I don't think you even need the phrase "cocktail" in there when you say the cocktail world would have been better if we had mm, done that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but you know, just focusing on on our wheelhouse for now, like, what would that? What you know, you've you've mentioned a few things that we can do to help and move the needle the other way. Like, are you seeing changes to that now? And what are some things that have that have sort of come out of that that have uh, surprised and delighted you? Um, I mean, like going back to the community side of it, I think that like the first thing that we can do, um, you know, when I was a kid and I was, I was playing little league, um, and, and they were teaching me to like catch a fly ball in the outfield, they would, um, say, or our coach would say, Hey, like when they, when the ball comes off the bat, it looks like it's going to land in front of you. Like, that's just, it looks like that's where it's going but it might go over your head and it's really hard to run backwards to catch it then. So just take two steps backwards and take a moment, take a beat and, and judge. And then if you need to come running in, you can come running in. But if you need, if the ball, it was going to go behind your head, you're already moving backwards and kind of like it, it teaches you like to be patient. So I think that like the first thing that any of us can do is do that in our life. Like just stop and take two steps backwards and like consider where other people are coming from. For example, um, you know, uh, I have a group of of like men in the industry here who um, we went through like a group therapy course together that was on like the history of patriarchy and um, you know white privilege and you know it kind of dug into um, restorative justice and what happens you know big big questions like what happens when someone in our community is harmed or what happens when someone that we love harm someone or harms us like what do we do and where do we go from that um you know and these like like there are plenty of of podcasts and books out there that you can sink your teeth into and and do some learning and as you do that learning what ends up happening is you end up unraveling all of the um or or much of the things that you were taught and i was raised in like a a a white evangelical christian household in virginia um i have a lot of unlearning to do And I have a lot of work to do as far as just like understanding my power and my privilege. And so because I went through this group therapy course on that with these other guys in my community who also saw that they needed to do the learning, um, we all have this like really incredible bond with each other because we've been incredibly honest with with each other about 
you know, like abuses that we've seen or suffered or in some cases committed in our past. Um, and we are now able to like speak openly about that with each other. And we have this whole like beautiful language and just like way of seeing the world. And, um, it's, it's like a really, really, really powerful, uh, relationship. And so how has that, how has that changed the way that, you know, you, you approach, I mean, your life in general, but also the way that you approach this industry, because I mean, I don't know, we're mental health has been such a big buzzword in this industry Mm -hmm. for a while, but Mm -hmm. like, I I don't know, like I, when I see it played out, it's like, oh, you know, we're going to do 45 minutes of yoga in the morning before we turn you loose on this cocktail festival for 18 hours of binge Mm -hmm. drinking. Like uh, it seems like we could do a little better than that. So like how have you seen this, this change play out in you and, and how can we do better as a, a whole? Well, I started my therapy journey in 2020, which was a year that a lot of people started taking their mental health journey mm-hmm. seriously. Um, you know, my 2020 went like this. My um, my dad, who I was totally estranged from, but he was still my dad, uh, died in the beginning of 2020. Uh, the pandemic hit. Um, we were, you know, on the brink of losing our bars. Um, you know, one of my dear friends found out that he had stage four pancreatic cancer. Um the George Floyd protests happened. I ended up engaging like most of my family on, on kind of like why this was important when I saw them posting kind of like, you know, racist memes and things, things like this. And, uh, as a result became like pretty much estranged from my family. Um, I then went through a divorce, although gladly I am, I am still dear, dear friends and business partners with my ex, a new, um, and, and my grandmother died. That was the first nine months of, 2020. Mm, And I ended, I came into September and I remember sitting in my like new apartment and just feeling like I didn't have a home. And through therapy, I was able to kind of like restructure my entire purpose, which like I was like basically a hamster running on a wheel of of our industry. You know, like we had won awards that were like really massively important to me. We, you know, were a part of this conversation and like obsessing over like creating these drinks and things. And then I got to September 2020 and I was like, none of this fucking matters to me. Mm-hmm. Like the drinks don't matter. What does matter to me is like, putting love and compassion into the world and into my community. And doing that is like a language that I was able to develop through therapy. And I do it every Tuesday at noon. I sit down with Jim and we talk, whether it's good things or bad things, we just, we, we just show up and I do it when I'm traveling too. Like I was at Camp Runamuck a couple weeks ago for, for alumni weekend. And I went and took my, slice of pizza and my penicillin cocktail and walk down to the dock on a chair by myself. And I, and I did therapy and it was like, mm-hmm. you know, if, if you show up, it will like completely change your life. Yeah. I think that a lot of us came to those sort of realizations when we all were sort of forced as it were to kind of sit down and take stock during the beginning of the pandemic when we had to not go to work or, or not do the things we normally do. That hamster wheel thing that you said resonates with me tremendously. I feel that mm-hmm. I was lost in a place of, uh, you know, stop this crazy thing. You know, it, it's it's been going so long in my life that I don't know what to do without it. And then suddenly it went away. <clears throat> and all the pivots we had to make, pirouettes. Um, and then, you know, we took, we, we collectively, the group that I'm a part of, took took stock of ourselves and we reorganized our entire company because of it. So I can, I can certainly see reorganizing your entire mental state of being and the direction that you want to go in. And, you know, of course, I'm very proud of you for doing so. Um, time just time just seems to fly so quickly by also, right? Mm-hmm. During all that, it's just like you blink and, you know, it's like five years later. And it's mm-hmm. it's really important to, like, just pump the brakes and, and kind of, like, get out of the car sometimes, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I remember something that uh, Eric Adkins uh, from, from San Francisco used to say, which is um, – the people that come into your bar years down the line won't uh, necessarily remember the drink that you made them, but they will remember how you made them feel. And like, right. that's sort of what I'm talking about is that like, we put so much energy into what is in the glass and 
you know, every person in this room has had world-class experiences and created world-class experiences through flavor for other people. But, but that is not special if you are not also treating your staff well and being kind to each other and breathing goodness into the world instead of, instead of discord and negativity. Yeah. I think, I think uh, we all are quite aware that we must pay attention to the details. I think that often we are paying attention to the wrong details, Mm. you know? Um, And I think that that's kind of where I sit, you know, uh, similarly, we paid attention to, uh, again, to use the analogy we keep using, what's in the glass, not what's all around the glass, the room itself, you know, what's, what's happening in that room, who's in that room and why they're in there. A bar bar is only as good as the people who are in it, you know? Right. Well, and to Greg's point about, um, or, or sort of like, um, his, his comment, exploratory comment really about, about, you know, like doing (laughs) yoga in the morning in a, at a drinking festival, like one of the things that I have restructured in my mind is how I think about balance because like that's another b- buzzword that we talk about, right? Um, and the concept of balance doesn't mean that you walk in this like puritanical straight line and y- you know that you are um, 100% dialed all the time and you you know t- take your mental health seriously every day and you take your physical health seriously every day and um the concept of balance that we should all you know consider is if you were walking down the street and you you know tripped on the sidewalk you're out of balance for a moment and you catch yourself and you straighten yourself up and you continue walking and so the concept of balance isn't about staying perfectly upright all the time it's just ensuring that if you do get out of balance that you're able to have a safety net in place that helps you get back to where you need to be. You know what I mean? And we do this every year around the holidays, right? We, everyone's like, ugh, you know, I'm going to have to, you know, go on a diet in January or start exercising in January. There's a purpose to that, which is that in, in the hall, during the holidays, often a lot of us are a little bit out of balance. And then in January, we kind of right the ship a little bit and that's okay. Like it's, that's a fine thing to do. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, listen, let's take a quick break and hear from our sponsors. We're going to come right back and keep talking to Chris Elford. Uh, and I want to hear more about Here Today, your new brewery on the Seattle waterfront in Seattle. So stay tuned, everybody. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Roberta's was founded in Bushwick in 2008 and has become one of the most iconic restaurants in the country. HRN made its home inside of Roberta's in 2009, and together they have become part of the DIY fabric of the neighborhood. Roberta's, the pizza restaurant, is open for lunch and dinner seven days a week and serves much more than just the famous wood-fired pizzas. Their team dreams up new salads, pastas, and sandwiches on the regular. Roberta's Tiki Bar is alive and well in the back garden, serving up frozen drinks in the summer and hot toddies in the winter. Stop by the bakery and takeout spot next door for fresh breads, sticky buns, and pizzas to go. And of course, there's the two Michelin-starred Blanca tucked away in the garden for truly daring diners. But Roberta's also extends beyond Bushwick, with multiple locations in New York City and now in Los Angeles. You can also find their frozen pies in grocery stores around the country. The spirit of Roberta's, like Heritage Radio Network, is everywhere. Here's to many more years of pizza-powered radio. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. And we are back. You are listening to the Speakeasy on Heritage Radio Network, where today we're talking with Chris Elford and hitting all of my favorite topics. I'm super excited about this conversation already. We've talked about history. We've talked about issues of class and gender and patriarchy and mental health. And we touched on another one of my favorite topics that I want to make sure we we talk about, which is uh, brewing. Because Chris, you opened a brewery on the Seattle waterfront fairly recently. And I, I definitely want to hear about um, that journey and how you got from this this gleam of an idea to having this this brew pub that you now own that exists in the physical world and is a real thing. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, the, um, the brew pub is so new, uh, so newly opened that it still feels surreal to talk about it in like the present and not future tense. It still has that new brew pub smell, huh? It sure does. <laughs> um, yeah. So our brewery is called here today, uh, brewery and kitchen. It's on the Seattle waterfront, which is kind of newly being reclaimed. There was this really old, ugly highway that went down it which they tore down and, and dug a tunnel underneath the city to replace it because it wasn't earthquake safe. And that uh, highway, it turned out, was like kind of a physical barrier between the uh, people that live in Seattle and our waterfront. And so it's kind of like being reclaimed from being just a tourist destination to being somewhere that locals go as well. And we're really excited to be a, a part of that. They're doing a waterfront expansion project. And, uh, you know, the company that designed the High Line in New York is doing our park system. And um, it's it's just like a really cool energy down there right now. Um, I have truly amazing business partners in the project. Um, my buddy, Texas Dave, does our operations and uh, our social media uh, and is a very, very gifted photographer and uh, has had a long career in beer. And then Mario Cortez is our head brewer, who is also from Texas, but with a name like Mario Cortez, uh, you don't get the, the Texas Mario uh, designation, um, <laughs> who has has brewed all over, the, all over the country. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, he's, uh, brewed all over the country and is just like an immense, immense talent in the world of beer and also a person of, of color, which is like, you know, a genuinely underrepresented more in the craft beer world probably than in, or in the brewing world than in other, uh, even in other aspects of our industry. So I'm super pumped that we're finally open. Um, people always ask like, why is it called here today? Uh, and oftentimes people will make like a gone tomorrow joke, which I'm so over. But um, the concept of here today is um, when you are eating and drinking with people that you love and you're celebrating or you're having a heart to heart or you're just catching up, you're not uh, worried about the future. You're not necessarily thinking about the past. You're just kind of like in the moment and loving life and you're here today. So it's really the name is really about being present around these like experiences of food and drink. I, I love that the the Germans actually have a word for this, which is one of my one of my favorite uh, you know things to borrow. It's uh, gemütlich, which is the the sense of like peace and ambiance that you get at specifically at a beer garden with friends. Um, I think here today is a much better name for a brew pub than gemütlich. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not gem suggesting a change. Uh, brewery and kitchen was taken, unfortunately. So <laughs> ah, <laughs> damn, that's next door on the same waterfront. Uh, well, listen, man, this is not a tiny project. This is not you know a Moria Margo, 240 square feet. This is a gigantic undertaking. I've followed along uh, your whole progress uh, uh, to getting the place open five weeks ago. But you had to raise a, a large amount of money. You want to enlighten our listeners on how you materialized this dream into reality by raising $1.3 million? Well, a huge part of it was kind of like not taking no for an answer from the world. Um, and a huge part of it was just like relying on the, on the goodness of others. So um, for anyone out there who wants to start their thing i'm going to speak to you now <laughs> um <laughs> you know if you read um if you read walden by henry david thoreau he talks about how when he builds his cabin he had to borrow an axe from his neighbor and he says that it's really good to begin any project by borrowing because it gives your neighbors an interest in what you're doing and he returned the axe sharper than he borrowed it. So like when we started this project or when you start any project, a huge part of it is going to be borrowing from people, borrowing inspiration, having late night conversations where you hone your concept, ideally being able to ask other people in your community, like, hey, can I take a peek at that business plan that you used when you opened this thing? Um, can I, do you have a recommendation for a lawyer? Um Hey, like lawyer, I need some like legal help setting up my company, but I haven't fundraised yet. And I, I'm, you know, have a really bare amount of money that I can spend. Could I pay you kind of more with interest when we get open? Or could you have your hum company uh, holiday party at our place? I think a huge part of it is like digging into your community. Um, so that's where I started. Um, so like a, basically like a bit of barter to begin. Yeah, it's just like, I mean, you just, you end up weaving this net through community that's like people that want you to succeed. And so like, I had, I mean, hundreds of meetings with people from 
you know, architects and lawyers to other like business owners to um, people who are kind of like movers and shakers on the Seattle waterfront. And all of this was just like to extend our community, hone our idea and try and get some idea of where we were going. Um, So we ended up doing equity crowdfunding, which isn't even like available to everyone. And, and so before I say any of this stuff that has to do with money, I know that as a white dude, I have a certain amount of privilege that made this easier for me. And the fact that it was as hard as it was makes me pretty devastated to think about how it would have been had I not like Mm -hmm. been me. Um, So that's just keep that as like a stripe that runs through everything of what I'm about to say. Um, We did equity crowdfunding. Um, We did it through the WeFunder platform first and then the start engine platform we raised about a million dollars through WeFunder and then about 250k through start engine um both platforms are terrible uh, <laughs> <laughs> they, they are i mean they're 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 like you know the, these are companies that are like you know they're they're like sec compliant bros who um yeah they do want to like make your dream come alive but they also like want a piece of it and the smaller you are and the less that they like respect what you do the less kind of like energy that they will put into what you're doing like if i had been raising 20 million dollars for a biomed startup they would have been like all over it um but you know i literally had people from this company like telling me that well no one's really like investing in what you're doing right now and i was like i, I fucking think differently you know, I, I truly believe in this project and, you know, it was, there was a lot of, do you, um, do you equate moments. that with them? Do you equate that with them? Basically what you just said, the numbers, no one's investing in this, meaning not 20 million, but people are investing in this meaning 1.3 million. <laughs> yeah. But like that was before we had raised 1.3 million. And these were people who were essentially saying like, sorry, it doesn't look like your raise is working out how you wanted it to. Um, the reason we think that is, is because no one's investing in brick and mortar. And I was like, the reason that I think it is is because I haven't reached the right people yet. And we just kept going. And, you know, we started doing like those seminars online, which, which you, uh, took part in. And kind of the idea was that we would reach more people if we had more public conversations with our friends kind of about this ecosystem that we're creating, you know, um, and I would mention it everywhere. Yeah, our little fireside chat. We both had a, a, a fake fireplace in the background, and we did an Instagram live together. Fireside chatting yeah. with with Chris Alford. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. It um, was, and we had a lot of engagement. Yeah, we did. I mean, even like that Ford's Gin class that I'm talking about. Like, we found several of our like major investors reached out to me after that, and were like, "Hey, are you like looking for investors for this brewery project? I really appreciated what you said about you know, kind of like." classic cocktails and and patriarchy and it seems like we're pretty like ethically aligned could could we like sit down and chat about this like major major investors found me through that through just like stepping out and and um and speaking so uh, the one thing that i'll say is just like um all of the people that you'll work with you know like finding a builder finding an architect going through a fundraising platform um they all want you to succeed in so far as they want to get paid, but they're not necessarily, I mean, if you can find people that are in your community that do that, like my buddy, Eric Hackinen, when you open Roquette, like partnered with someone in the business who like built the place. And so like, that's a really uh, powerful thing to have kind of in your back pocket um, because there's like a certain level of support and care that goes in there. And they're not just like looking at the numbers of your project and saying like, you know, we need to, make our money here and then we will like see you later without really any intent of like helping you make your project better. Um, but you know, I would just say that like, I'm sure before the show is over, you will like give my info. Like people write to me on Instagram all the time and like ask me questions or to share like business plans or, you know, whatever. And, and as I have time, I love answering those because other people did that for me, (laughs) which helped me hone this thing and like paying it forward is the best is the best thing you can do and uh, like even like one permutation farther than that i love the idea of the person that asks me that question succeeding and creating their dream and then being that person that other people ask yes like that's the real success yes yeah totally agree with that like you're 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 
creating and building the roots and the and the branches of your tree. Yeah, and like I don't matter. Like I'm, you know, I've I've had a period of relevance and enjoyed some success, but like we've all seen people in the industry who hold on to the microphone for way too long and I would much 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 rather be the person behind the microphone now who is like giving it to other people and like helping them achieve what what they want to. I don't need to keep creating more and more dreams over and over again for myself. So do you think that at large, that means this is where you will stop creating new spaces? Um, now that you have four, I, it's four now, right? Yeah. Yeah. We have four places. Well, I guess I would say that, um, you know, just because I don't want to like keep creating my thing doesn't mean that I won't like partner and help other people you know, create theirs. And the other thing is like the, the Washington state laws are such that if you get a brewery brewery license, you're licensed for an additional like three tap rooms. So I'm assuming that here today at some point we'll put some other like tap tap rooms around the Mm -hmm. greater Seattle area. But, um, yeah, just like, um, it's not like I don't have ideas or anything, but I just think other, other people have a lot to say. And I think like, you know, you go to, um, I am not going to say the name of this group, but if you go to certain cities, like if you go to San Diego, <laughs> like all of the bars, yeah, nobody's going to guess owned, the group. <laughs> all the bars are like owned by the same group. And I'm, I'm not throwing stones here. Um, or I'm not intending to throw stones here because some of my very, very dear friends, you know, have, have places that are a part of this group, but same. there is a certain sameness in cities. If it's like one person is controlling the entire narrative and all of the, other. Mm-hmm. right. Yeah, couldn't couldn't agree more. Oh, Mario Margo. Well, you know what though? Th- you know what though, Damon? Like, I was a bartender at Amoria Margo, and I had just passed the um, certified Cicerone exam. I think there were less than ten in New York City at that time. Now there's probably five hundred. Um, and I remember uh, Ravi coming in during service one night, and he was like, "Hey, like, don't you know about beer?" And I was like, "Yeah." I mean, officially, yes, I do. And he was like, do you want to open a beer bar on St. Mark's? And I was like, yeah, for sure. And he was like, great, give me a concept and a name by Monday. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, bro, yeah. I'm working service all weekend. But anyways, that's what he handed me the reins to create Proletariat, which has been open for over 10 years now. And like, I was, a, mm-hmm. that was my first thing that I got to cut my teeth on. And I'm still immensely, immensely proud of it. So like someone mm-hmm. handed me that opportunity first. And it's the reason that this thing that is, um, you know, has been pretty like impactful in the beer community in New York city was breathed into existence was because somebody like saw a young, you know, bartender with some potential and was like, Hey, you should, you can do this. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's been our sort of business model at large, you know, uh, especially since the pandemic and we reorganized and became an official company, you know, we find the, the talent and we put them in a place that, that, that lets them breathe life into it, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that that's pretty in line with the sort of mentality that it sounds like you have. And I I definitely think that I'm, I'm ready to uh, prepare for a deep gasp. I'm ready to stop opening new things uh, and, and, and be more, (laughs) be more in the background and help other people open things. Mm -hmm. I don't think, I don't think overthrow right now needs to open anything new, but I would be happy to help someone open something of their own. Yeah. You know? And that, and that's the thing, right? You're uh you know, you're not just making a, a, a seat at, at the table for someone, you're literally just making the table bigger. Well, it's sort of like have you ever seen that graph that's like as you like learn a, a subject, it's like, you know, in the beginning it's like I know nothing and then you're like, wow, I know a lot about this and then you you keep learning and you realize, oh, actually I don't know anything. Right. Like right. I'm sure we all went through that with cocktails and spirits where we were like, um, <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. And then you go, you know, you go and visit some bar across the country and you're like, I am nowhere near the edge of what's going on. (laughs) Um, But that's, that's kind of the same with, with other elements of our career too. Right. Or it should be anyways, is like recognizing that the thing that I thought was so important to say has now, it's not that it's not important anymore. It's just that like the thing that I want to say is changing and then eventually you're like, the thing that I want to say is that that guy should be able to say or that woman or, you know, yeah. should be able to say what they want to say. That's what I want to say. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. 
Uh, Chris is, I mean, like, it's been too long, man. I I just love listening to you talk. I haven't said a lot this this episode, but the thing is, I like. Well, that's you this, handing this, him the mic. <laughs> I know that's exactly right. I mean, but I just you just brought like a really amazing episode to us, and with a lot of really powerful content, and I really appreciate it. it sounds like you've like you've you've gone through a lot recently, and you've come out on the other side in a really powerful way. Yeah, you know yeah. and. It's 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 really refreshing to hear, uh, especially because right now, especially there's like for for me personally, I I've kind of passed the torch too, you know, with Grand Army. It's like I I'm not like really around all the time or very much at all these days. But you know, I just like there's only so many articles you can get in like like blurbs and cocktail books and whatnot before it's like, all right, give someone else the mic, as you said, you know? Yeah. And so I like hearing – the reason why I'm still doing this show after 13 years is because I like hearing every week the new people who are doing stuff and being able to really understand and and be proud of the fact that our industry is ever-evolving. And as you just said, you know, it's like as soon as you think you know it all, you're the dumbest person in the room, right? And so yeah, it's just – it's – Good to hear you talk about this stuff today to to prove me right. <laughs> <laughs> well, just yeah. to reinvigorate this style of conversation, this style yeah. of thinking. You know, I think that we're quick to get defeated. Uh, we're quick to lose sight of the things that are truly important, and then we we continue to stumble on that sidewalk instead of righting ourselves. We go into you know self deprecation or depression or what have you. And, you know, every day is a new day. We can continue to win if we continue to, to fight, right? Well, I think also, what you know, to Damon's point, there's like, um, when we talk about giving power to other people or like wanting to see more diversity and inclusion in the industry, like pe- people don't talk about where that power comes from. Like there's not a an infinite amount of like seat at this table. It's not like the table keeps getting bigger. There's still the same amount of like outlets and and bandwidth out there for there to be like messaging at all. And some of that power has to be seated by people that look like us, which it, which includes not getting to judge the competition that you love judging every year or not being uh, you know, a part of that new book or not being at that panel at Tales because you recognize that there's someone better to be there who has a different perspective. Like having three of the same people on a panel is fucking boring. Having the same identical 20 people that are in every cocktail book is also fucking boring. You know what I mean? So if we can, in the interest of just the world being a better place, take those two steps backwards and let someone else come into that power vacuum or, or, you know, uh, put a hand out and help somebody get to, um, you know, that place of power We're we're making the world a better place. We're making the bar world a better place. And ultimately I think we'll find more personal happiness. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that it also, I mean, it's one thing that I, that I say a lot is that if you surround yourself with people who think like you, you're going to make really stupid decisions, you know, you want Hmm to have people around you who are gonna who are gonna talk you out of your blind spots and your unknown unknowns and your worst impulses you know surrounding yourself with with people who agree with you is how you get dumbass bullshit things like a football team called the Washington Commanders like <laughs> nobody wanted that and it's so clearly a decision by committee and you can see examples of this happening all over the place and it's 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 great to have you as as a voice against that. I want to make sure we talk about something that is esoteric and niche and mundane <laughs> before we go, because I really want to know, speaking of, you know, uh, not doing the same thing everybody else is doing, I want to know what you're brewing mm. at here today, because I want to know what you're I, doing. And I also want to know about this cocktail program you have going on there as well. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Fascinating. It's fascinating. Uh, yeah, we're, we're brewing. So we're calling our style of beer patio beer. Um, which is essentially like, um, you know, so it's Irish or, <laughs> uh, Patty O'Beer. Very funny. Um, <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Still got it. <laughs> okay, dad. Um, you know, Damon as a musician, 
um, hopefully you can relate to this. Like there is really good music out there that um, if you sit and think about it and put on really good headphones, you can um, enjoy it and kind of sink your teeth into it and and uh, gain value from it. That same song, if it was playing in the background at a restaurant, would also be like a, a perfect vibe that you could ignore and just have a conversation, right? Then mm-hmm. there's also music that is really good and you sit there and you you can sink your teeth into it, but it would never be good background music. Like it would never be in a sense so good that it's ignorable. Mm-hmm. Um, that is what uh, we're kind of like reaching for with beer is that if you want to nerd out and sit there and like really, you know, be kind of like heady about the whole experience, there is something in each beer for you there, or you can just come in and pound some beers with your buds and, and not worry about it and not have to understand every like idiosyncrasy of like why this beer tastes what it is. So our beer is generally on the lower alcohol side. It's generally more kind of like elegant and nuanced in flavor um a little bit less kind of like the macho sort of like in your face flavors um that are still pretty prevalent in the craft beer world um and then we're also you know mario is a is a mexican american and he you know has a a lot of flavor memories from growing up in the kitchen with his family and he's making beer that utilize a lot of ingredients um that he grew up with like we use a lot of corn in our beers um he makes a saison with piloncillo sugar that has this really nice earthiness. So, you know, his, uh, the, the beer that we're making is very, um, it's, it's pretty crushable. Like we have a, we have a 3% uh, Grodziski on tap called, uh, Icarus oh, Space. Yes. um, you know, it's Grodziski. If you've never had it before, uh, I urge you to seek it out. If you're, if any of your listeners are in Texas, uh, they can get a really fantastic example from a brewery called Live Oak, uh, that's in Austin. Mm-hmm. But, um, Grodziski is a, uh, very very light you know three percent alcohol super light in body smoked wheat beer that hails from poland and it's kind of an archaic style but sort of a miracle of brewing too because you know there's like smoking malt as like a means of drying it um you know started to fall out of popularity at some point and that point was like pretty close i don't i don't have the timeline memorized but like was pretty close to the the timeline when like all beer stopped being dark mm. because like the like the way that we roast malt in a gentle way was sort of like a a a um a technological advancement during the industrial revolution but anyways this beer is like the most crushable thing in the world we make ours with 90% smoked wheat so when you're going in for a sip you get this really big smoky aroma and then there's almost no smoke on the palate it just feels like you're crushing a light beer So it's again, one of those things that like, you can think about it and be kind of like in the moment and heady with the whole thing, or you could just ignore it and, and crush them all day, which is generally what I, what I try to do. God, I'm so into that. I, I, and I've, I said this, I've said this for years, you can hide a lot of lazy and incompetent brewing under like a 12% chocolate stout that's Mm -hmm. made with like coffee and Mm -hmm. cacao nibs and like ancho chili peppers or whatever like anybody who has the like grapefruit sized balls it takes to brew like a dark mild or something under four percent abv Mm -hmm. in this day and age has as my undying respect as a brewer because there's nowhere to hide bad craftsmanship there Mm -hmm. yeah i mean mario is is like hands down going to be one of like the new and powerful voices in the seattle brewing scene this guy is incredibly gifted and also you know has a natural gift but also has a um you know a willingness to study and and learn and hone his craft which i think is a pretty like rare combo yeah oh man i can't wait to visit um i'm actually going to live oak next week so i'll uh i'll get a head start on the (laughs) krasinski yeah 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 dude it's so good and then the cocktail program, Souther, uh, yeah. so we're doing, so so here today, Brewery and Kitchen, obviously it's a it's a full service kitchen. Um, our food is really, really fantastic. My buddy, uh, Josh, uh, is is heading up the kitchen there and uh, we're making, you know, like Lacey Edge burgers and uh, hot dogs that are cooked in beer and then finished on like a bin chiton, like diatomaceous yeah. earth grill. So it basically tastes Sweet. like it was finished on a campfire. Um, we have wings that are cooked confit and then just fried to like perfectly crispy, nice. um, in the fryer. The food was really fantastic. Um, 
And then we have some really cool wines on draft that we sourced from uh, our friends at Chateau Deluxe in Oregon. And then this cocktail program, which like when I was ideating what we're doing here, like obviously number one, the beer needs to be the star. Mm -hmm. But I wanted there to be something for like, if there's a group of, you know, four people who come in and one of them doesn't like beer or nine people come in and one of them doesn't like beer. I wanted that person, that one person to feel seen and like, see themselves reflected in the offerings here so we did uh we created this cocktail program that we call choose your own adventure and we have four cocktails that are on draft and they're all non-alcoholic they are all served on crushed ice no garnish really simple but very aromatic um they're all lengthened with tea and we we you know clean our lines religiously so they're we're using just like fresh ingredients and small kegs Mm -hmm. um it's a very short draw system but if you want to add spirits to them you each cocktail works with any spirit you design each cocktail to be comfortable with i want it with tequila i want it with bourbon it works yep gin mezcal rye um, very cool they they, they all work with all of it and like that they stand alone as they come out of the tap they stand alone as i just want a a, a drink non-alcoholic yeah yeah that's incredible i mean we have we have That's like so cool. it's kid the place is uh kid friendly up until eight PM. Uh and we have people come in and they're like, Hey, I'll like you, you do you have like soda? Do you have like soda for, you know, a kid or something? And like, no, we just have these cocktails, but they're really good. I you know, they're they're not like beat you over the head with flavor type things. And like, you know, so there's like kids in there like drinking non alcoholic cocktails <laughs> in the tap, which is kind of oh, rad. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Well, and you've got a you've got a unique opportunity there that you're on the brand new waterfront that you spoke about, but also like cruise ships dock there. Obviously, it's tourist driven, generally speaking. Plus, it's still kind of a hub for where locals like to go, right? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people that live down there, and not necessarily a lot of places for them to go. They're all used to kind of like either ordering in or leaving like their immediate neighborhood to go somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's it's pretty rad to be able to like reach these people down there and the choose your own adventure cocktail thing is is fun for me because like like non-alcoholic cocktails are cocktails right yeah. it's not a different thing it's literally a cocktail i mean technically speaking in the old you know like uh, in the historic definition of cocktail they're they're not a cocktail you know there's no there's no spirit in them but we call things cocktails that don't have bitters in them shrimp cocktail you know what i mean it, What's yeah. that? Shrimp cocktail. <laughs> fruit cocktail. <laughs> yeah, fruit co- shrimp cocktail. <laughs> yeah, delicious cocktails. Yeah, we have shrimp cocktail on tap. No. Um, <laughs> Ever no, very innovating. That, like, I just think that looking at them that way and like, I, I mean, I love seeing uh, when I go into a bar and see that their like NA cocktail offerings are on the same menu and in sort of the same breath right. as the as the alcoholic ones. At, at Vinny's, our wine shop, um, which is like a little natural wine shop and and oyster bar. Um, our cocktails there, so it's in the same space as Navy Strength. It's just separated by a wall, but they share a kitchen. And um, you know, Navy is like this big, kind of like bombastic environment. And Vinny's is really like delicate and gentle and beautiful. And there's all of these plants hanging up in there. And you know, we showcase local artists each month in there. And the cocktails are much different from navy strength drinks because we wanted them to be so the navy strength the drinks are really big and bombastic and have all these like kind of eccentric garnishes at uh vinnie's the cocktails have no garnishes and they're very sort of like subtle and delicate and gentle and honestly they're my favorite cocktails in our in our company right now like we do a um we do a a beeswax aged uh, banana white negroni there um Oh my god! <laughs> that features this. Um, I know, dude. It's so good. It features uh, Genziana Fernanda, which is like um, Southern. I have to. I'll bring you a bottle to um, to PDX. To, uh, PDX, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Um, it, my friend Skip is making it, and it starts its life as this um, oxidized wine, very much like in like the the style of sherry that's made out on the Washington coast, and then he, you know, sort of makes a uh, a gentian. Um, spirit out of it and it's really elegant and uh yeah that that goes into our banana white negroni that we age in bottles lined with beeswax and it's just very delicate and gentle and i don't know very pleasing but we have other drinks on the menu that are 
completely NA, and next to each of the cocktail, it just says what the ABV of the drink is, which is an yeah. idea that I got from my buddy Jeffrey Morgenthaler, yep, who was I'm like, hey, you've been like, breweries have been doing this for years. Yep. Like, you list the ABV of what something is that you're drinking. The math is not hard to do, you know? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Man, I would have thought that this show hit all of my keywords already, but then you said banana, white, Negroni, and I was like, okay, now, <laughs> now wait, we've got all of my keywords accounted wait, keywords for. or safe words? Yeah. <laughs> they're the same. They're the same. Yeah. Uh, well, we are uh, unfortunately running out of time, um, and I love this, actually. When we run out of time and we still feel like we have so much to say, it just means you got to be back on the show again. It just means it was a great episode. So really appreciate you spending some time with us today on the Speakeasy. Um, people want to follow you. Uh, they can get a hold of you on, you said Instagram, and it's just your name, Chris Elford, uh, C-H-R-I-S-E-L-F-O-R-D, Elford. That just means the Ford, I've been told. Um, <laughs> and uh, and do you, have, you got here today as well, but it's not just here today, is it? It's here today, Seattle? Or here today, Seattle. Yep. Here to, yeah. On uh, on Instagram. If you if you find me on Instagram, you'll you'll find uh, all, all of the bars are in my profile. Cool. Um, and everybody's, to free to, all everybody's, free to, everybody's free to DM you straight away? Okay, great. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> reach yeah, out for baseball honestly. advice from Chris Elford. Um, I mean, yeah. I, I know a good bit about baseball. Yeah. Uh, really, uh, really proud of you. Really excited for here today. Really excited to see you next week in, in Portland for PDX. Uh, we're doing look a little Amore Margo reunion. It'll be me, you and Lindsay Madison for a bit of time, uh, doing a thing with the uh, Jägermeister at, at Portland cocktail week. It's going to be great fun. Heck um, yeah. and, uh, and you're going to bring me this, uh, banana, banana maniac thing uh, <laughs> i'm gonna bring you i'm gonna bring you a bottle of genziana fernanda i will maybe bring you some banana white negroni but like all right the, that spirit is what is special about this cocktail it's not the cocktail that's special happy that uh cool. yeah super <laughs> cool man thank you yeah if anyone's ever in seattle please um you know don't hesitate to to look us up i i love showing people this city and and at least sending them a list pointing them in the right direction of places to go and certainly like for any of your listeners who are either like struggling on their mental health journey or like struggling with balance um i i hope that you're able to like find similar answers um as as i was and uh and struggle a little bit less because i know that it's uh it's not easy out there it's true well thanks chris you're the fucking best yeah. um we need to have you on like every like other month <laughs> <laughs> but for this week that's it um check out i mean god i can't wait to go check it out um <laughs> here today it's just also like i love the concept i love everything that you do out there it's very cool um but yeah check out heritage radio network for more programs like this one and until next week y'all cheers cheers everybody cheers, cheers again everybody. <laughs> <laughs> So you don't shun the devil with your rock. The Speakeasy is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network. Food and drink radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe. Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like, Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next farm bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to The Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts.